couple months now, and I still haven't got used to these glasses. So, hey, great, for, great to see you here. Uh, uh, thanks for joining us, joining us online. Let's stand, and uh, let's make this place get a little loud. Yeah. You know? Hold on. Now i got to put the earpiece back in. It's a little anticlimactic. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Excuse me for a minute, but I got a song to sing. Might not be on key, but it's from my heart. And no one else can tell it what the Lord has done for me. Well, this might take all day, so I better start right now. Well, it might get loud. Well, it might get loud. Heaven's coming down, down, down. It might get loud. It might get loud. Heaven's coming down, down, down. It might get loud. I don't know if you know this about me, but I don't have a halo. No, I'm not a perfect man. Well, I'm just glad to be the child of God When I think of where I could have been, should have been, would have been If you hadn't stepped in Well, I got a praise on the inside, I can't be denied And I gotta get it out of right now It might get loud Well, it might get loud Heaven's coming down privilege. How are you doing today? Great to see you. Hi, Dylan. How's it going? Good. I'm doing good. Thank you for asking. Will you join me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for being able to come together and worship you. Father, right now we just set aside this past busy week, everything that we need to get done even yet today. And Father, we focus our attention on you. You are worthy. You are magnificent. You are eternal. You are kind. You are for us. 
Lord, and we want to hear from you. Thank you, Lord, for the word. Thank you for preaching. Thank you that we get to focus on the truth of the word of God because you change our lives with that. Father, would you help us today be good ground for the truth of the word. And Lord, not so we can know more, but that we are changed. Father, help us take that beautiful change out into our community, into our families. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. 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 You may be seated. Hey, it's great to see you. I'm Pastor Robin. If we haven't met, I would love to meet you. Um, if you are visiting with us today, I do want to let you know just a few things to help you relax, whether you're joining us in the building or online. I just want to get you equipped. So you'll notice that when we go into worship, there may be people around, or you may see people raising their hands to worship the Lord. There's no right or wrong way to worship. But it's super important that we worship. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. There you are. <laughs> I also want to let you know, um, underneath the crosses on either side of the auditorium, you're going to find our altar prayer team. And they would love to pray with you. If you've got something on your heart that you would like the Lord um, to move mightily on, please go pray with them. They would love to do that. I also want to let you know our bulletin. We do have a hard copy bulletin. If you're here in the building and you want to pick one up, they're just right in the... Uh, uh, narthex in that little area there on the ushers table or you can always check it out online um, our website is realchurch.org and you'll find the bulletin there and all kinds of great information so i'm not going to go through a whole lot of detail with bulletins today because i want to encourage you check out the website that's where all the details will be found or of course you could call the front office sound good Okay, I do want to let you know, though, if you're visiting with us and you have a prayer request um, or a comment, we've got a connect button on our web page. If you'll click on that and just let us know that you were here, pop your question in that, we would love to get a hold of you. So, Maranatha, will you join me? Let's give our visitors a really warm welcome. <laughs> amen, amen. Okay, so... I want to highlight this beautiful picture on our bulletin from Doug Wood. Take a look at that. Isn't that fun? Tedaguch. That was one of those words. You know, it's really funny. Depending upon where you travel in the country, there are like names that you really like. Need to know how the locals pronounce them. That's one of them. So, very cool. If you would like your picture featured on our bulletin, please shoot it in to communications at realchurch.org. We would be happy to feature that. So um, I want to let you know with the announcements, um, we had a huge event here yesterday. Take a look at this video. Huge turnout. From what I understand, the um, parking lot Hey, it looks like just another Sunday morning full. in church. <laughs> just another Sunday morning. Okay, so this picture here. Um, that is uh, Banu. He is the son of Rachel um, and um, Jacques. Jacques. Yeah. It was, this was his very first fight, and uh, he won. Yay! He was emotional, oh, excited. That's so excited. It was, it was really cool. So he, he won. Hey, the place was packed. It was a great turnout. So many people that I have talked to last night, I asked them, because they were like one of you, and I asked them, have you ever been to a boxing match before? Never have. Are you having fun? This is great. I mean, it was just really exciting. The ring was set up right here. There had to be 600-ish people, I'm guessing, maybe more. The parking lot was packed. They were parking in the grass, out in the field, around the building. Um, Rachel and Jock, they just did a great, great deal. This was a great fun time. <coughs> the boxing actual matches, uh, man, several of them, very intense. A couple knockdowns. Um, 
the sportsmanship is incredible, and they're looking after their safety. Um, it's quite an event. So next year, if, you, if you've never been to a live boxing match, I encourage you to come because it's, it's top notch. And this is one of the best venues they ever go to. So momentum is building. Yeah, this is an amazing room to have that happen in. <clears throat> okay, so with that being said, you'll notice the chairs are a little closer together because when they took the ring down, they put all the chairs together. It was people who aren't used to putting the chairs up. So they're, you notice you're a little closer to your neighbor. Yeah, but doesn't it feel good? Huh? It's like you're a little closer to your neighbor. Just so you know, the chairs, this is not normal, but it's just great because it was a great event. It really was. It was fantastic. Did you compete? I did. I broke. Is that how you wounded your hand? Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so, no, I didn't, but I did. <laughs> I, I'm almost positive. I didn't go get an x-ray, but I'm sure I broke a finger bone right here in my wrist. It is so, so I can't pick up my Bible. I can't touch or do any. What's this? I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> I'm sorry, squirrel. I seen, I seen the word Oreo. I seen the word Oreo. Wow, oh, Oreo cowtails. And it's like taped shut. Wow. And I only have and one you got, hand. you got a bum hand I only there. got one hand. Here, let me help you. Okay, so oh. for those of you who are watching live, um, Stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> and for all of you here, stay tuned. This is just a little diversion. It's like, oh my gosh. Pastor Mike, I saw this. I sh your mom's trying to get your attention. Mother, you're not supposed to ask that question. Just know this. I broke it. It was dumb. It's a guy thing. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you. No. Shh. No. But I broke, yeah, I'm, I'm like, oh, it is so sore. Uh, that means we can make now up Now I'm stories. just looking for sympathy. It is, oh, no. Okay, so they say you should always read something before you read it out loud. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to read it out loud. Pastor Mike, I saw this and thought, of, thought you would enjoy. Have a great day. A friend. Well, thanks, friend. Oreo cowtail. Pretty wild. Very nice. What was I saying before I was distracted? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about the chairs. No, really. Oh, tete so, gooch. Yeah. If you're French, it's tete gooch. I don't, I don't. So I want to let you know, we have a corn maze. Have you seen it growing out there? Oh, my gosh. Not only is it a corn maze, it's, we've got a smaller maze. Take a look at this video. Please, I want to encourage you, go to the uh, corn maze. So like it mentions, it's there open from 11 to 1 on Sundays in the month of October. It's free. It's a great opportunity for families. Like I mentioned, one of the things I love about it is that there's a, a corn maze. So, you know, for people who are um, like my size and shorter, you could maybe get lost in there. How fun with it? No, I'm just kidding. You won't get lost. But um, the other thing is we have, uh, I think it's oats, uh, we have another corn maze for the smaller kids so that they have an opportunity to go through the maze and not uh, get lost and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, corn maze is free. Lots of family fun. Come after church today. Um, I do want to let you know we have some new drinks at the Cup of Faith. Take a look at this video. Okay, we're at the Cup of Faith. It's fall. And last Sunday, you heard advertise some new drinks. So we're here today. Miss Heather, the one in charge, the captain, the chief, the one that does everything. Thanks. Runs the team. Yes. So we're going to be tasting pumpkin white mocha, pumpkin latte, apple ch pie chai, apple blast smoothie, and I'm going to try a new... Cranberry orange scone. Cranberry orange scone. Yes. Okay, we're going to end with that. So we're 
Give me go. Pumpkin white right. mocha. We have pumpkin white mocha right here for you. Describe it. What is it? So it has pumpkin and then white chocolate in it with espresso and steamed milk. It's actually really good. That's good. <laughs> that's going to be um, your catchphrase. Wow. Okay. That's. You know, I, I was never into the, the fufu. I like just coffee. Don't add a whole bunch of stuff to it. But this is like we're getting really to, good. We're oh getting to you. A pumpkin white mocha. Okay, what's next? Okay, so the next one is just a pumpkin latte. So just pumpkin, espresso, and milk. No white chocolate in it. If you don't want all the sugar, this is it. That one. Oh, this tastes really good. Well, that's good. I'm glad you <laughs> like it. I do. It's good. Okay, so no, for non-espresso drinkers, we have the apple pie chai. Apple pie. Which is cinnamon, chai, and steamed milk. And it's hot. <laughs> it is hot. <laughs> um, I like chai tea. It smells amazing. This this tastes like I'm drinking an apple pie. That's I mean, our goal. Oh, really? I mean, it's apple pie all the way. This is great. Oh, my. Okay, I'm keeping that one. That one's your keeper? I'm, I'm keeping that one. Okay. So for all the people who like cold drinks, we have an apple blast smoothie. So, apple yep. blast. Yep. Caramel, cinnamon, apple juice, and then we mix that all together. A little bit like an apple pie also. It's actually really good. <laughs> mm. I'm glad you enjoy it, Pastor Mike. Mm. Okay. So then we're gonna try a new uh, scone you have it here. It is, it is cranberry orange scone. So for the people who don't want like chocolate in their morning, that one's a more healthier option. Who doesn't want chocolate in their morning? Health nuts, I guess. I love the scones you guys sell here. I do. They I, are I like amazing. I like them all. This is a winner too. Uh, this glad. is great. That catchphrase, they're actually really good. Christy Brager made a t-shirt with, with this logo on it for me because she got a kick out of that. And then she made a bunch of little stickers. So you need to come by the Cup of Faith because I have been busy sticking some of these all over. So you need to see where they all are. See if you can find them all because, like I said, I stuck them all over the place. Come by and check it out. Great drinks and a little bit of mystery. <laughs> I don't know what's funner for me each week or when we get a new uh, roll out of the drinks at the Cup of Faith, the watching your interaction with the drink itself or watching you try to pronounce the names of all of those drinks because that's entertainment all on its own. And yes, they are really good. So, And every cup you drink, everything you purchase at the Cup of Faith, that goes to support a wonderful cause. I do want to let you know that we have an event coming up that needs your attention. So whether it's for you or someone in your world, it's the Ransomed Weekend. If you have been impacted by trauma at any point in your past or maybe even currently, please come. Um, it's the 14th through the 16th. There is a booth in the lobby today where you can get more information. Um, even if you're going to the booth to get more information for someone you love, please go get educated and you can find out how they or you can come. Gentlemen, Man Church is this coming Saturday. Have you been yet? You want to go do that. Women's breakfast is coming up on the 15th. Ladies, mark your calendar. And youth, I want to let you know that the Minnesota Youth Convention is coming up. Registration is online. So check that out. And if you have been interested in taking membership class at Maranatha, community membership classes actually start today at 1230 um, back in the Ed Wings. So take a note of that. Sound good? Are you feeling all equipped? Hello? Yes. <laughs> and if you have any questions, where are you going to go to find out? Realchurch.org. Way to go. Awesome. With that, let's listen to Pastor Mike and Breaking Stereotypes. Welcome to Breaking Stereotypes. Again, it's going to seem like I'm reading from today's headline news. A little bit of a recap from last week as well. Thomas Paine. The supposed quietude of a good man allures the ruffian, while on the other hand, arms, like law, discourage and keep the invader and the plunderer in awe, and preserve order as well as property. George Washington, there is nothing so likely to produce peace as to be well prepared to meet an enemy. 
This is the mindset, the mentality that laid a foundation for America, a free country, a free people. Something we should definitely think about. Amen. We need to know our history. Amen. Amen. With that, I want to invite you. Let's stand up and take a few minutes to greet one another, say hello, and then we'll go into worship. Thanks. Good morning. All right. Let's see. Am I on? All right. Let's worship our God. There we go. <laughs> oh, wonderful, wonderful. All right.
with trumpet sound. Hallelujah. Oh, may I then in him be found. Come on. Dressed in his right. Jesus, come on, my heart will sing, 
the King of kings and Lord of lords, who is worthy of our praise, worthy of our honor. Hallelujah. He is good. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Yes, he is. What was that first stanza of that last song about our salvation? Uh, thank you for your thank you for thank salvation. you for your salvation. Thank you for your unending grace. Who can say amen? Amen. amen? amen. Praise God. You may be seated as we prepare ourselves to worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. Thank God for your faithfulness, your your giving. God is good all the time. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for your incredible salvation that we are saved through faith in you alone. You paid our price. And Father, we worship you. First of all, with surrendering our lives to you. Not our will, but your will be done. And then that follows in our giving and in our serving. How we treat people out and about. The grocery store, the hardware stores, at work. Father, that we'd be filled with the fruit of your spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Father, that you would be exalted. Please accept this offering as we come to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. And I keep trying to find a light on my own apart from you. I am the king of excuses. Every selfish thing I do Oh, what's going on inside of me? I despise my own behavior This only serves to confirm my suspicions That I'm still an enemy of the Savior I want to be in the light When you are in the light I want to shine like the stars in the heavens And all I want is to be in your light. Oh, yes, all I want is to be in your light. The disease of self runs through my blood. It's cancer fatal to my soul. Every attempt on my behalf has failed to bring this sickness under control. Tell me what's going on inside of me I despise my own behavior This don't turn my suspicion That I'm still a man in need of a savior I want to be in the light As you are in the light I want to shine like the stars in the heavens I want the Lord to be my light my salvation is all I want is to be in the light. Oh, yeah, all I want is to be in the light. Oh, I want to be in the light. Cause you are in the light. Shine like a star in heaven. Oh, Lord, be my light. Be my salvation. It's all I want is to be in the light. Yeah, all I want is to be in the light. Yeah, all I want is to be in the light. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. That was an oldie. Was that like a 90s uh, DC talk kind of thing? Is it 90s DC talk? Charlie oh. Peacock did it. Who did? Charlie Peacock. Charlie. He's not really well known. Okay, well, Charlie Peacock. I but then DC it. Talk made it DC famous. Yeah. They both did. Okay, so all you people out there talking. So you gave your lives to Christ in the 90s. 
because Christian music became very important to you. And usually the, the genre of the time of music where you got saved is really like near and dear to you. That's why like for me, it's Larry Norman, Res Band, Petra, second chapter of Acts. Yeah, yeah. man, I mean, Larry, who? <laughs> Ushers, can we please uh, come get this? Rabble rouser over here and get, take, him, take him out. Take him out. Can I give this to you? She's just that good. Um, it was a nice throw. Yeah, we'll, we'll give her all the credit. It was a nice catch. It was a nice catch. Um, so it, really quick, I just want to stop. We have a special guest with us. Um, I saw him out in the lobby. I don't know where they're sitting. Uh, but Pastor Oren, Sandberg's lovely wife, Bonnie, where are you? There they are, right there. Why don't you, why don't you stand, Oren? You have preached here before. It's so good to have you up from Lake City visiting his mother-in-law, Bonnie's mother, Faith. So it's just, it's good to have you here. Yes, welcome. <laughs> welcome. Um, he feels pretty at home here. He bought you what? Mary, you can think he's okay, but he's not that good. No, I, I, I am just teasing. We have been in a series that I never intended to turn into a series. And that is talking about this idea that God wants you to know him. God wants you to know him. I think about the church of Jesus Christ. We spend more time, more energy, the creativity of the pastors in all the churches in the cities, you know, all around us in every city. You know, they're trying to preach, they're trying to seek from God a good message, and they're trying to stir the saints, and they're trying to tell you how to live. And basically, unfortunately, I think so many times when we're not careful, it gets, it turns into belly, you know, navel gazing. Like we're worried about ourselves so much, and how am I doing, and, and all the messages are hard, but friends, I want you to know, Christianity has very little to do with what you do. It has everything to do with the relationship you maintain. Oswald Chambers, some of you should know this by now. The main thing about Christianity is not the work we do, but the relationship we maintain and the atmosphere produced by that relationship. That atmosphere. I have to admit, and I'm use myself as an illustration or an example only because I can tell you what I have felt my whole life. I got saved. I mean, I got saved, and I got this wonderful relationship with God. I showed up in religious circles and scared the tar out of them. <laughs> and I scared them. I made them nervous because I wasn't, I didn't fit into their well-established religious games, and they're all proper, and they're doing this, and they're doing that. And it's like, I didn't know any of that. All I knew is that I loved God, and, and he had filled me with joy, and I was so happy, and I'm just joy-filled, and I'm just being a regular person. I didn't learn how to be religious until I became institutionalized by the church. And then I realized right away, that garment does not fit very well. Oswald Chambers, just think about it. The main thing about Christianity is not the work we do, but the relationship we maintain and the atmosphere. See, that's what ministry comes in. That's where living style comes in. But it begins with as we spend time with him. Last week we talked a little bit about the fact that you become like the people you hang around. I know so many Christians trying to be like Jesus, but they never spend any time with him. Got quiet in here. Many of you have, have given me positive feedback. You have shared with me that, man, the last few messages have changed your life. You have just felt drawn into a closer relationship with God. It's marvelous. Quick recap, a couple weeks ago I spent a message that we talked about spending time with God. 
And it was just two points. Spending time with God. I'm not talking about devotions. I mean, I kind of am, but not the study where you're just busy. Time spent with God must be intentional. That was the first point. It must be intentional. Mark chapter 1, verse 35, it says, In a great while before day, Jesus went out to a lonely place, and there he prayed. In, in uh, the Gospels, it says, when he came out to the place. It was the place that he went often and spent time with God. Last week, I asked for the show of hands, how many of you, that message, you, you, your spending time with God has increased. And it's like, man, 90% of you, you're like, somehow or another, you were impacted saying, I need to spend more time with God. Now, if you have an hour, that's great. But you know, realistically, not mo- many of you don't have an hour. Especially if you've got kids, you're busy. This idea of spending time with God, remember I talked, it's really just, because the second point is to be still. Not to go to him with prayer agenda. You just need to sit in his presence. Think about it. You and I boast about the greatest thing in life is his salvation. We have a relationship with God. But it's the smallest thing that we do in our life is spend time with Almighty God. We're busy doing and rushing around and running, but really the most important thing we could do is just (sighs) Father, I'm just here to spend time with you. That's all I'm doing. It'll take a while, a while to quiet your busy mind. Unlike Jesus, I'm not saying that you need to do that every day, but there needs to be periods of time where you are going after spending time with God. I think you should try really hard to have devotions, read a Bible verse, pray, pray talk to God. You need to do that every day. But I'm talking about this idea where you just sit Sitting on the dock of the bay. No, never mind. Um, we just sit. You know, that's, you know, when you first start dating, you ever been there? You're just so enamored. You're just so you know, infatuated. You just want to hear their voice. You call them. And then you hang up. No, you hang up first. No, you hang up. <laughs> and then you hang up. And then you quick call back. I just want to hear your voice. Yeah, okay, goodbye. I mean, you just do silly things. Why? Because you just, you're in love. You just want to hear the voice. And I have to admit, one of the things about long-term marriage, you know, long-term good marriage, is sometimes you really don't got to say much. Now, some of you young marriage are going, oh, I hope that comes quick. Um, (laughs) Sometimes there's just something about you don't, you don't really have to say a lot. You're sitting in their presence. And there's something about the, you don't even have to say anything. It's like, God, I just like being here. Because you think the same thing. Yeah. And when one of you starts thinking kind of silly, it's kind of dangerous, isn't it, Mother? <laughs> no. <laughs> we talked about spending time with God. Now, some of you remember in that Sunday service, I was really fretting a little bit about, am I really going to do this? Do I really feel led that I'm just going to be silent for about five minutes? And we were just going to all just hush. And we were. And we realized that people are watching online and how that was going to come across. Five minutes of just dead silence. Yet, if you'll be honest... It was one of the most spiritual things you ever did in church. Some of you said it was my best preaching during that quiet time. <laughs> you know? It was just to, to be in his presence. Then last week we talked about the results of spending time with God. Well, there's four. Number one, you get to know him better. When you spend time with God, you get to know him. Again, over the years, how many times have you heard me say, there's sometimes I don't got to pray about things because I know him. I know know what he'd like. I I know, I know God. This is, yes, this is no. 
I don't got to do the spiritual looking things like, well, I'm going to pray about it. You see, one of the benefits, the results of spending time with God is you get to know him better. Number two, you become more like him. Number three, you are compelled to minister. You can't help it. It's like the early apostles when they were being persecuted and told to be quiet. They said, how can we? His word is like fire shut up in my bones. I I just have to. The apostle Paul says, we are compelled by the love of Christ. You see, when you spend time with him, you care about the things that he cares about. He is willing that none should perish, but that everyone would come to faith in Christ. You don't get that burning sense unless you spend time with him. We think a lot of things are important. And we run around busy doing this and we're doing that and we're doing this and we're sure that we're sure that God cares about it. Well, you know, he might, but it might be really quite honestly low on his priority list. He really wants every one of you to know Jesus. He wants everyone in the world to know Jesus, to realize that his son paid the price. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The top priority on the mind of God is salvation. And we run around like smoking is a big deal. I tell you what, the church of Jesus Christ, I believe, owns a, owns a, owes a huge apology to all the smokers. We have somehow portrayed that little white stick as the greatest, most powerful sin you could ever commit. When, are you serious? Friends, listen to me closely. I'm not endorsing smoking. All I'm trying to say is you're swallowing camels and filtering her out gnats. Ooh, it got quiet in here. I tell you what, if you go to heaven smelling like hell, it just shows the grace of God. Right? I was just... And number four, the fourth result of spending time with him is you want to get to know him more. The more you know him, the more you want to know of him. It, again, it's, go back to, I gave the illustration of the mountains. When I first saw the mountains, they were like, wow. And as I got closer, I saw more of the mountains. I'm like, wow. Then we got into the mountains, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like every, everywhere you turn, there's more to experience. And, and you realize that it would take a lifetime and you still wouldn't know all of the intricacies and the grandeur of the mountains. And that's the way it is with God. As we walk with him, we discover more about him. And it's like it's thrilling, it's rich. It's a great experience to know him. To know him means you want to know more of him. And then I compared it to marriage as well. I mean, I went to Bible study and there's this woman there making eyes at me. I was like, whoa, I like Bible study. I heard her name was Orlean. And I was like, that's unique. I think I'm going to sneak up on her and just, you know... You guys didn't get that. Yeah, you did. You just thought it was lame. I did, I did too. But you know what's really interesting is I, as I got to know her, I'm like, God, I just wanted to know more about her. And I got to know her more. It's like, I want, I got, I want to know more about her. And I shared with you last week how, I mean, now after 42 years of being married, I mean, man, I, I really know her. And it's been an adventure, you know why? Because she's kept changing. She, she hasn't stopped changing and evolving. And just about the th- time I think I got her, she zags again. <laughs> and the hunt is on to get to know this new person. It's like, wow. And you know what's really interesting? You young people, man, enjoy your pretty skin. Doesn't got any stuff, any abnormalities in it. It's nice and smooth because you're heading to wrinkles, baby. We all are. Enjoy it now because it's going to be changing. It's going to be changing colors and different things happen. It's like, why does it do that? It's just amazing. But I have to admit, um, when I look at Orlean's face and I, and I see those crow's feet, I get excited. I, 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 I like it. They're, they're, they're beautiful. It's like I've, I've watched them develop. Um, I have to admit, I've seen a, a couple of stress wrinkles that I'm sure I caused, which is 
a little frightening, but no, I, but you, you, you just want to get to know them more. This morning, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to really, we're going to park on this idea of knowing God. Because it is the most important thing. So this is part four of a sermon that I thought was a one-time, one-element one sermon. So this morning, the title is Knowing God. Knowing God is Christianity. Okay? Ephesians chapter one, a verse I have not read yet, but it, again, it has this idea of knowing God in it. Ephesians chapter one, verses 16 and 17. Do not cease to give thanks um, Paul's talking about, you know, hey, I've heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've come to faith in Christ. You've gotten saved. And um, he says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, mentioning and making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Again, you hear Paul here, he's praying. What do I want you to know more than anything else? I want you to know him. I want you to know him. I want you to, to develop in the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. It's tragic that some people spend a lot of time studying Christianity and missing Christ. That's exactly what Jesus had a frustration with and a, a, a missing and anger with the, with the Pharisees. He says, you study the scriptures thinking that in them you have eternal life, but they speak of me and you've missed it. You become a bunch of rule followers. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You lock up heaven by making it so stringent that nobody can get there. Woe to you, blind Pharisees. You travel land and sea to make one convert, and when you do, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you are. You've totally missed the boat. You tithe this, you look through that, you do all these religious things. He said, you brood of vipers. He was pretty harsh. He wasn't acting very Christian, was he? Some of you, you get this idea of Minnesota nice, is just everything, every, everything is always just... No, it's not. You brood of vipers. This same Jesus who said, you know, turn the other cheek, love your brother, love your enemies, is the same guy who made a whip, went in the temple and drove out the money changers because they were hurting people. They were distorting what the temple was all about. They were all about themselves. And that bothered Jesus. You see, Christianity is knowing God. Because there's political Christians, but then there's the Christianity that you and I talk about and understand. It's a relationship with God. It is a relationship. You see, it's not just knowing about, but it's knowing him. It's not knowing about, it's to know him. 2 Timothy 1.12, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for I know in whom I have believed. I know him. I know him, I know him, I know him. You see, religion is to know about. Is to know about. Now, some of you are gonna sense early on here that this really is, is a salvation message. We're heading to communion. And I'm gonna invite some of you that you've never truly surrendered your, Lord, your life to the Lord Jesus Christ to do so today. Do you see, because otherwise you're just, you're just wasting time. I'm gonna invite you to surrender your life to Christ. Invite Jesus, have a relationship with God. And some of you are gonna sit here and go, oh, I'm a Christian, been a Christian a long time. I don't wanna hear another salvation message. If you ever get tired of hearing the salvation message, then you don't really know him. Yeah. Plus, you need to hear it again so that you can repeat it to others. Amen. Have you, do you share the gospel with people? Do you invite people to have a relationship with God? Your friends, that's what it's all about. Hello? 
You see, religion is to know about something. Facts, stats, stories. As I mentioned earlier, the Pharisees, you know, they were, uh, the, the religious machine was going. And for many, unfortunately, clergy and laity alike, they just go through the motions. Ah, oh, we got to do church today. Yeah, so they do church and they put together a good worship set and they have a good message and they just churn out the machine. Lives are rarely changed, but we're doing the machine. Friends, it's about having a relationship. Religion is knowing about it. Christianity is knowing it. Bob Dylan. How many of you know Bob Dylan? None of you do. <laughs> you raise your hand. You don't know Bob Dylan. You've never been to his house. You've never talked to him. You know about Bob Dylan. Right? Okay, so how many of you have been to a concert, a Bob Dylan concert? Oh, a few of you. Only a few of us. Mm -hmm. And all of you who raised your hand before, you hadn't even been to one of his concerts. <laughs> and yet you said you know Bob Dylan. Are you kidding me? Man, I mean, isn't that the way it is with all of our celebrities and people like this? They try to give us the impression that we know them. We don't know them. You, you don't know them. You just know about them. And now, if you're a big fan of somebody or, or whatever, you get to know that, you, you think you get to know them. I mean, again, I'm just speaking from my own opinion and what I've observed that Bob Dylan and... I think anybody who's a major celebrity like that, they're a little bit paranoid because you never know, you know, what's going on around you, the fans, and they're crazy people. Um, but Bob was really quite paranoid. In fact, Orlean and I, we've been to probably, we've probably seen him in concert four times. I really know Bob. We're tight. <laughs> um, he is really shy. I mean, it's incredible. So literally, if you go to his concert, you're going to study his backside really well because you're going to, they're going to see this the whole concert. He's doing this. He plays a song and then he turns around and he goes, thank you. Thank you very much. And then he turns around again like this. You paid big bucks to look at his backside. <laughs> However, uh, the last time Orlean and I saw him, we we're up in Duluth. This is a little bunny trail. Just enjoy it. Okay. Okay? Okay. So we saw him up in Duluth in the outside stadium there, where they call it, um, that little village. What do they call it? Canal Park. Canal Park. It's, yes, Canal Park. It's that, they have ben, Bentleyville. Or is that just in the wintertime? Uh, you know where I'm talking about. Okay, so we're out there. Man, I tell you, this last time he was in concert, this was probably four or five years ago. He actually was engaged, looking at the crowd, playing. And then every once in a while, I mean, it was, he was outside of his character, man. He was wild. He'd go like this. He'd play, and then he'd go. And we're like, Orlean and I both looked at each other and go, he moved. <laughs> it's like, wow. Now, you know, you study Bob, Bob Dylan or in your runs. It's really funny. I just said a lot of things about Bob Dylan. I could be entirely wrong. <clears throat> he might not be really shy. He might not be paranoid. But I've come to a lot of conclusions in my observations of just whatever. I have heard Christians, you and I, say things about God that is so wrong Well, God doesn't do this, and God does. Really? What, did he tell you that? We at times come to some pretty hard, fast conclusions about God because things that we've heard or we've kind of generally heard, you know, people talking about, and it's like this experience. Friends, your personal experience does not dictate Christian theology. This book does, 
and we enjoy a relationship with him. It's in that relationship that we speak. You see, religion is to know about him, but the relationship is when the knowledge drops 18 inches. The relationship begins when you take what you believe of God, you know of God, and it drops 18 inches into your heart, into your being, where you acknowledge the things that are about God are true, and you let it drop down and you surrender yourself to him. I tell people all the time, I was converted long before I got saved. I was converted to Christianity. I heard good sermons. I heard good theology, good teachings. And you know something up here? I believed every one of them. And I was, I was emotionally even moved by some of them. Em mentally, I was like, yes, that is so true. I believe that. And you read the scriptures and I believe that. I believe that. But I didn't begin a relationship with him until that knowledge dropped 18 inches and I said, not only do I believe it, I surrender to it. I give myself to this. When it becomes a part of your heart, your soul, your spirit, it's that, for la I don't know how to describe it. Sometimes I, I come up short trying to describe it. It's that aha moment. It's that seeing the light. It's that surrender. Don't you get frustrated every once in a while trying to witness to somebody, trying to share this, this relationship that you have with God with somebody who's, they have Christianity up here? It, it gets really, it, it gets difficult. It's like, no, and you're trying to say that, no, you really don't got it yet. You know, you don't actually say that, but you're thinking, no, you really don't got it yet because it's just up here, I can tell. I can tell by the way you talk and it's like, no, it's a relationship. It's a surrender. I give in. Aha! There's an old song. It's, um, he walks with me. I come to the garden alone. While the dew is still on the roses. I can't sing it because I have laryngitis. <laughs> I've been struggling with this crazy laryngitis for a while now. I come to the garden alone. This is what we're talking about, spending time with God. And the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses. In other words, I hear him. And he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me the most important thing that really, really matters. He tells me I am his own. There is something about when you come to that surrender moment, when you quit trying hard to make Christianity work, when you just throw yourself on the altar, so to speak, when you throw yourself before his feet and you say, God, I am yours. God, I am yours. I'm not gonna try so hard to figure it out. I give myself to you. And he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. You know, we all want approval, acceptance. Every one of us do. But the greatest acceptance that any of us could ever hope for is to hear God say, I accept you. I accept you. You are mine. But here's the deal. He can't take something that doesn't want to be his. It's when we say, God, I, I, I'm at that point. I want to surrender my life to you. I want to give you my life. Unreservedly. You know what he does? He says, okay, you are mine. 
You are mine. And the joy we share. Who's the we? It's it's us and God. The joy we share. I I sometimes, in, in my relationship, I mean, you've heard me say it. It's really true. I really mean it. I don't act like a pastor. People have said to me more times than not, you, you don't act like a pastor. And I go, thank God. Thank you for recognizing it. Like the words of King David, you have put more joy in my heart than their wine and their grain abound. I am way too happy. And people have said, you act way too happy to be a pastor. What a sad comment. And the joy we share. If you walk out of your times with God and you feel lesser than, if you feel like somehow or another you're not good enough, I want to challenge you to tarry a little longer because you will never walk out of his presence ever without feeling lifted up. You cannot spend time in his presence without being exalted. You know why? Because he grabs you, he hugs you, and you know something? Nothing in his life really matters. In fact, every problem, for a little while anyway, disappears. It disappears. Truly, there are times when when we come into God's presence, and I've been there, and his presence is so rich. And friends, what I'm telling you now is not every time, but there have been times when his presence is so rich that for a moment, I'm not married, I don't have kids, I don't have a job, I don't have a care in the world. I really, nothing really matters except for hearing and feeling that he loves me. It's like God loves me. It's like, it's just... Wow. And again, you can feel a joy. You, you cannot walk out of God's presence without feeling more joy. The songwriter understood this. In the joy we share as we hang out together, none other has ever known. You can't explain it. Nobody else can really describe it. He speaks And the sound of his voice is so sweet. Now, obviously, this is a little melodramatic. You know, the birds hush their singing. However, it's interesting when he speaks, you don't hear anything else. Nothing else really matters. God wants you to know him. He wants you to know him. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. For me, as a minister of the gospel, I will tell you this. When I see this and I hear this, the melody that he gave to me becomes my life theme. It becomes my life theme. When I'm spending time with him, it's in, it, becomes my life, it becomes the melody of my life. You know it. You hear my hobby horse often. I can't help it. It's the theme of my life. It's the melody he put in me. I hate religion. I don't like religious people. I love them in Jesus. But like Jesus, not liking the Pharisees, everything in there within that repels me. And my favorite verse, John 10, 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, but I've come that you might have a life and have it abundantly. Oh my God, live it abundantly. I mean, to live a little reckless. You know, speaking about his reckless love, I mean, just, oh my God, he set us free. Why do we live like as if we're in such bondage? Within my heart, as the, as the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he reminds me that I am his own. Friends, you become dangerous as Christians 
because you're going to be so ablazed when you spend time with him and you hear him say, you are my own. When you hear him say that, your life becomes on fire. You become a dangerous Christian, dangerous to the enemy's camp. Amen? The gospel, being saved. Sometimes people don't like these words, repentance, conversion, salvation, because they like their religion in a nice little box and it stays there. And I love those words. Salvation. It means that I was about ready to be destroyed. But I was saved. I was rescued. I was ransomed. Somebody paid the price to buy me back. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 6. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a, you know, a Pharisee, one of those guys that was loaded with religion, loaded down with it, knew it all. It's, you know, doing all the right stuff, but he sensed he was missing something. Something wasn't quite, it's like, God, I gotta find out, this, this Jesus guy. So he goes to Jesus, basically we pick up the story. Jesus answered him and he said to him, most assuredly, I like King James. Verily, verily, or truly, truly. You need to understand this. Pay attention. I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is not politically correct, however. You and I as Christians, we kind of, you know, oh, we're on this way around. I don't know about you, but when you hear those words of Jesus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born again, you will in no way see the kingdom of heaven. That's pretty bold. Amen? You see, there's only one way to God, and that's through Jesus. The good news is there's a lot of ways to Jesus. You can be Catholic, Lutheran, Baptist, Episcopal, E-Free, Christian Missionary Alliance. Now, you can't be a part of any of the religions that don't talk about Jesus, however. You must be born again. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, I have to admit, he probably had a little bit of a smile on his face too. I can only imagine. Most assuredly, I, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. When Jesus said, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he's basically saying, yeah, you gotta be born again because once you're born of water, I can see you're here, the water broken, you, you, you were born, you're here in the physical world, but now you need to be born of the spirit. Your spirit which died in Adam, now needs to be resurrected in Christ. We turn back just a little earlier, John chapter one. John chapter one, verses 12 and 13 says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, you know, of water, water and blood, they kind of go interchangeably there. Not who were born of, of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. You see, we become born again when we have that surrender relationship, when the knowledge that we have in our head drops down into our heart and we receive Christ as our Savior. We invite him to come into our life. We acknowledge that he paid the price on Calvary. It says, to all who received him, It's a good question. Have you received Christ? 
Sometimes people will say, well, you know, I was, I was baptized as an infant. Oh, man, your parents had great faith. That's good for them. They wanted you to know God. They really did. Now, here's where, theologically, we're going to be different a little bit from, you know, some of the more um, liturgical churches. Because most all evangelical churches have to do with this idea that you need to make a choice. You, it's your choice. It's you making the surrender, saying, I receive Christ. To all those who received him. You see, Christianity is a first generation deal. Choose you this day whom you will serve. It's your choice. I mean, if it was up to me, if I could sprinkle you with water, I'd, I'd bring something in here every Sunday and I'd sprinkle everybody who went through the door. I mean, if it just took a good shaking, you know, maybe as Pentecostal, we'll just, we'll just do a good shaking. Wake me up. Okay? Oh, wait, you can do it in the forehead. It's always better, right? Whoa, in the name of God. Hallelujah. I'm oh, you're saved. It, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Every one of you in this room who are listening, you have a choice to make. It's your choice. Do you want to give your life to Christ? Do you want to invite Christ in? You see, this is the greatest decision you will ever make in your whole life. Tragically, people come to the end of their life. I stand at funerals. I stand with families, and, and they will say to me, I'm not sure if they accepted Christ. And you can just sense the weight of their words. I'm standing and getting gas at the holiday station. This was a few years back. And she said, Pastor Mike, you're awfully dressed up. I said, yeah, I just came from a funeral. Oh, she said, that's bad. I said, no, not necessarily. I like funerals. Because I get to share the gospel. And people are listening. And then, so then she's, by my response, I said, no, I like funerals. She goes, oh, yeah, that's right. They're going in a better place. And I said, maybe. Friends, listen to me closely. As serious as I can be, maybe. Have you made Jesus your Lord? Jesus said, truly, truly, I tell you, unless you are born again, you will in no way see the kingdom of heaven. Some of you in this room, you give your life to the Lord many years ago, but you know something? He's been your savior, but you've never made him your Lord. You've never surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Therefore, our lives at times, they grow dull, they grow cold, they grow stale in the things of God because he may be your savior, but he's not your Lord. To all those who received him, have you received him? Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Have you opened the door of your heart? You see, you have to. The door handle's on the inside. It's your choice. Open the door handle and invite him in. Lord, I, I invite you into my life. As scary as it is, I invite you to explore every dark corner, every dark room of my heart. Because I believe that you pay the price for all the sin I possess. I invite you in. Paul, he was in a jail. And we see the story in Acts chapter 16. God delivered him out of the prison. And because of that, the prison guard was about ready to kill himself because he knew that if any prisoner escaped, he was going to be killed anyway. So he thought, better to save honor and just throw myself on my sword and kill myself. Paul, when he seen it, he stopped him. He says, no, 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 we're all here. We didn't run away. You're okay. And in verse 30, the guy asked a question. He says, and he brought them out and he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You want to know, what do I got to do to be saved? Now, the reason why they asked that question is because he heard Paul and Silas all night long singing praises and glory to God. They're worshiping God. 
They, they weren't like a lot of Pentecostals. They believed that God does great things, but until then, we weep, we mourn, we sorrow, we tell, oh, woe is us. Not these guys. Doesn't matter what situation I am in. God is on the throne. God, you are worthy of adoration. We're in these chains and stuff, but God, you are the only one who can destroy body and soul and hell. These guys, whatever earth happens on me, it doesn't matter. To live is Christ, to die is gain. It doesn't matter. God, you are worthy of worship. You are worthy of adoration. We worship you. We sing to you. I come to him in the garden. Okay, they didn't sing that song. It wasn't written yet. But they're singing praises and glory to God. This jailer is amazed. As no doubt... I'm guessing he sensed the presence of God in the prison in their praise. The Bible says that God inhabits the praise of his people. If you and I would praise him more, God, other people would sense his presence. But too often, we're belly aching and complaining just like everybody else in the world. You and I are supposed to be overcomers. Amen? Amen. We're giving glory to God. Well, the stock market just crashed another 20 points. Praise God, God is good. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm not counting on the things of this world anyway. My eyes are fixed on him that is seated on the throne. He run, they run in, and, and the first thing this jailer asks, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved, you and your household. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he spoke the word of the Lord to him, and all who were in the house what do I got to do? You need to receive Christ. I'm going to invite all of you to make a very serious commitment to Christ through the act of communion, which is the central figure of all of Christianity. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You have no life apart from me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is for the forgiveness of sin. I paid your price. Amen. You see, repentance means 180 degrees. I, like, I love these words, to repent. I'm busy living my life. I get confronted with the gospel. I slow down. I listen. I'm like tuned in. And then I finally come to that realization, I don't want to live this way anymore. God, I give, I give my life to you totally. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to go this way. It's conversion. You're going one direction and you go another. Salvation, you were lost, but now you're found. The veil is lifted and you see things differently. Nobody is going to judge you in this place. We're going to be moving around, doing a lot to get the elements to have communion together. Listen to me very closely. And, and like I said, this is in this, nobody's gonna judge you. But if you do not mean to fully surrender your life to Christ and to become a Christian and it wholeheartedly mean it, I want this to go from here to here. Jesus, I'm inviting you in my life. Don't come get communion. Like I said, nobody will judge you. Nobody knows where you're at what you're wrestling with. Don't come and get communion if you do not mean to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, to truly surrender his life to him. And then to you older Christians, when you come today, I know that you received Christ a long time ago, but would you make today a fresh start by saying, no, not only, Lord, do I take you as my Savior, I take you as my Lord. There's gonna be a fresh surrender to his authority, to his kingship, to who he is in your life. Friends, there is no power in our life until the power of God rests in there. Amen? So if the music group team wants to come on out here, what I'm gonna ask you to do is very introspectively make a deliberate decision this morning to come and receive the emblems because it's your intention 
to give your life to Christ. Invite him into your life. If your life has not been radically changed, you haven't met Jesus yet. Because Jesus radically changes lives. Whether you're the horriblest of sinners, a felon in j- prison for years, and you come to this, you see the light, and you make this drastic life change, or you've been, you've been so lily goody two shoes your whole life, I want to let you know something. You are a foul offender and need a savior. You cannot think, well, my sin ain't that bad. It's horrible. It's ugly. And we need Jesus. They came to the table. The Apostle Paul writes, he said, I, res- I share with you what was given to me. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, he blessed it, and he gave thanks. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. So we do that this morning. Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus. We give our lives afresh to you today. And some in this place for the very first time in a meaningful surrender. In Jesus, we rejoice. Praise God. God, thank you. Thank you for your mercy. I'm very excited. I know that many of your lives are going to take a drastic turn up. Because God wants you to know him. And knowing God is Christianity. It's knowing God, not about him. It's knowing him. Amen? And the Apostle Paul wrote, there, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. All these older things pass away, and they all become new. It's a wonderful adventure, walking with God. We're going to get into this next week. Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. It's right up there with one of my favorite Bible verses. He says, for circumcision or uncircumcision counts for anything but a changed life. Friends, you know something? All these religious things we do don't really matter. The only thing that really matters is, has your life changed? Because when you meet Jesus, your life gets radically changed. Amen? Hallelujah, God is good. Would you seek this week a couple times just to sit in his presence and wait to hear him say, you are mine. You are mine. It'll change your life. Amen? Amen. Father, as we are dismissed from this place, I pray that we will take seriously your wish that we'd spend time with you instead of just doing a lot of religious things. That we would leave religion and begin a whole new relationship. And Father, we thank you for all this. In Jesus' name, amen.